All right, the next keynote or the last keynote of the conference and the one which I'm hoping is going to leave you inspired is by Kevin. Uh, Kevin is the founder and CEO of Hike. Uh, I just got to know Kevin maybe a month or so before and we started working together. Uh, and I, it was a request for him to, I requested him to come in and do this talk. So I'm really hoping that he can come in and leave you guys inspired. So over to you, sir. Thanks, Naresh. So it's great to be here, and I know this is the end of the conference. I'm going to keep it hopefully short and exciting enough. Um, I'm sure most of you guys have heard about Hike. Um, we are, you know, we're not very old, still a very young company. Uh, it's been 39 months since we launched the first version of Hike, and I'd love to tell you our story. Um, so 2011 is when I moved back to India. I was uh, studying at Imperial College in London, I, where I spent sort of uh, my sort of four years doing a master's. And when I came back to India, um, I was in Connaught Place in Delhi uh, with some friends. And I used to go there pretty often. And one day, there's a Haldiram in Connaught Place. And behind the Haldirams, there's this street where you have some great sort of you know, street food. And um, I was sort of buying some chaat and some Golgappas off sort of one of the vendors. And you know, it was very interesting. I noticed one thing that was very different on that day than sort of any other day. And between these people serving you know, their food, there was one thing keeping them busy. And it was this. This was, this was the guard phone at that time. This is the Nokia 1100 phone. It was the, the most popular phone at the time. It drove the telecom revolution. It was 2,000 rupees. Uh, it had a flashlight on the phone. So it was a trucker phone, very popular. And you know, that was it. That was the reality for these people. It was that cart they had in front of them, and more importantly, this phone that could barely make calls or SMSs. And the reality of these people were limited to the sort of that sort of, you know, world. And I had an iPhone 4 in my pocket back then, and India didn't have 3G, so it was locked, logged onto Edge. And, you know, that's besides the point, but the whole point was that, you know, I had the, I had a smartphone in my pocket with sort of access to the internet. And, you know, folks like myself and all of you guys over here back in uh, 11 had lived on the internet for about 15, 16 years. And you had a billion people in this country, people like, you know, these guys who had no clue as to what the internet even was and how it could it sort of impact their life. And it dawned on us that day that, you know, there's going to be a billion people come onto the internet for the first time in their lives on a mobile device. And this would be a first phenomenon globally. No market before had sort of this size of a population come online for the first time in their lives onto the internet on a mobile device. And it really took me back to my first time experience. The big question was how did these guys come onto the internet? And it took me back to my sort of first time experience. And you know, I still remember this was my second computer that I had. Uh, this was a Packet Bell, you know, 166 megahertz computer. It had a turbo button to sort of increase the, 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 the frequency to sort of 200 megahertz. It had a CD-ROM drive, a three and a half inch floppy drive. Someone came and installed a US robotics modem in my house uh, and came with a CD um, and installed Netscape. Right? These are the fun days of the simple internet. And the only thing that we had access to in the sort of entry point on the, on the internet was Yahoo. That was it. It was a directory of websites and it was a very sort of simple sort of phone book at its time. But that was the entry point uh, onto the internet. And the problem is, a billion people coming online first on a mobile device would not have all this stuff. And the big question was, what would bring these guys online? And it became very clear to us that something very, very cheap, given that the disposable income and the purchasing power of this country is overall very low, something very cheap, and more importantly, something that people very easily understood would be the way that people came online. And there is nothing better understood than communication uh, in this world, in this lifetime. If you take away all the devices, if you take away all the sort of gadgets and so on and so forth, what's left of the human species is communication. So that was the idea. We thought that messaging or communication would play a very large role in bringing India online, and we didn't know how. That was the idea. So we launched Hike in December 2012. And we launched with this idea that because people had, you know, because there are so low number of smartphones in the country, um, not everybody had data, not everybody had smartphones, 
And even if you had a smartphone with a messaging application, it was impossible to stay connected with your friends and family because, as I mentioned, not many people had smartphones and data. So we launched with this idea of Hike to SMS, where you can message folks who had Hike for free. But more importantly, you can message folks who didn't have Hike free of cost too. And we would use the SMS channel as seamless backup to make that actually happen. And funnily enough, within 24 hours of the launch, we were number one in Germany. It was really odd. And in 48 hours, we were number two in the Middle East. And so this is our reaction. We said, well, what is going on? Uh, and it turned out that one of our engineers had sneaked in 128-bit encryption to the one. And Germany and Middle East are extremely, extremely paranoid about security. Um, what about India? We actually had zero traction in India. This is hilarious. <laughs> we were building for India, and we had no traction there. And the, the seed money that we had raised was going to last till about March uh, 2013. And we had a target of 3 million users. So we had zero people in India. And we had a target of 3 million users. And we had about two months left. And the big question was, what do we do? And so with our backs pushed up against the wall, we launched this thing called Talk Time Rewards on 31st of Jan. And the, the idea behind Talk Time Rewards was very simple. It was a Hail Mary that we sort of did. Um, if you join the app, you get 10 rupees of data. And if you would invite a friend, you'd get 20 rupees of data, which would let you use Hike free of cost and experiment with the, the application um, without having to sort of pay for data up front. And keep in mind, back in 2012 and 13, you know, three years ago, the market was very, very early. Um, we had probably no more than 20, 30 million smartphones and even less people on data. And what we saw next completely shocked us. Within a couple of weeks, um, we were number one in the App Store. Our messaging volume grew 50x week on week for four weeks. Uh, and we added 3 million users in one month. And we were on top of the world. We thought we had solved all our problems. And so we ended up with about 5 million users by the end of March. Um, but, but the problem was, we just were not. Um, the, scale, the scale was huge. We had built our stack for 100,000 people, and we had 5 million people using our service. So our service crashed not once, but twice, thrice, four times. And messages started getting lost. Push stopped working. And we had to end this awesome growth hack that we had called TTR because we just could not keep up. And we had this idea of a report card that we sort of you know, used looking backwards. And this is what our report card looked like back in sort of March 13. It was horrible. We were failing on almost everything. So I'm going to continue in the um, interest of time. So you saw the report card, messaging service reliability, uh, pretty poor. Um, and we didn't have enough features on the platform. We really thought like hike to SMS and all these things were good enough for us to sort of build something pretty incredible. And more importantly, we'd only built for the smartphones. And smartphones are very low in penetration back in 13, and we had to sort of build for the older platforms like Symbian and BlackBerry and so on and so forth. And um, we sort of started sort of on that. How much time does it take? About 30, 40 seconds? Yeah? Okay. okay. I'll wait. <laughs> it was pretty poor. Uh, we had done an okay job on the features and we were not there on all the platforms. There's one thing we had solved for that most startups struggle with, which was growth. We found a way to very extremely cheaply acquire a bunch of users. And that was the, you know, I wanted to show this to you, but that was the big check mark on a report card, right? The green tick when it shows up was, was growth. Yeah, you guys see it, great. And, um, you know, our CPA was actually about eight rupees. This is an old number. It was peanuts. And we'd find a very cheap way to sort of grow the service. And at the back of that, um, we'd raised about $7 million, our Series A, from SoftBank and Vibe. The problem is, as soon as we raised this money, in, and you know, the goal is this money would last us about 12 months. As soon as we raised this money, um, within a month, we started to see a lot of churn, obviously. Uh, we were very naive back then. We don't know what was, was going to happen, but we saw a lot of churn. About 80% of our user base completely churned off. 80%. And we were like, what just happened? And so we went back to the drawing board, 
And we call sort of the next six months sort of post TTR, the six months after sort of TTR. And our main goal is to stop churn. So we scaled up our team from 15 to about 40 people. Uh, we did three big things. We improved reliability. We launched a few, few new features on Hike. And more importantly, we launched more platforms. And if you guys were not built for Symbian, it is horrible. S60, S40, thank God they don't exist today. Even the BlackBerry platform, they are horrible to build for. And we had no choice. Uh, S40, that explicit phone there was a very popular phone that made our life very miserable back in 30. Um, we launched stickers. Um, it was an instant hit. Um, we have some numbers that I'll share with you later. And you know, we were, we were, we believe we're a design-led company. So we at, at that point in time, three years ago, we, we, we wanted to build some really cool and sexy stuff. So we ended up building, this is the first version of Hike on the iPhone. It was really slick, right? We were very proud about this. The problem was nobody understood drawers. In India, nobody got it. People had just gotten their smartphones and they could barely use them and people weren't sort of used to swiping. So we completely trashed this UI and we built a brand new UI, which was a very simple sort of three-tab design. You had your friends, you had your chats, and you had your updates. And um, we saw a very large bump in our retention uh, between sort of April and September that year. And we had stabilized churn by June. And so our report card was looking a lot better. Um, that brings me to sort of October, um, the winter. Winter was coming. And, <laughs> and we, had, we had built TalkTime Rewards 2.0. We believed now we were ready. Our app was much better. Engagement and retention was much, much better. And um, we had done a few things. One was we got the app in a good shape. We had launched more platforms. And we had focused TTR 2.0 on engagement. But there's something we call you know, the romantic value of the application. At the end of the day, you're building for people, not for robots. And people forget that. And so we did a lot of cool things in the application. And you know, on December 25th that year, when people opened the app in the morning, there was a gift waiting for them. And you could open the gift. And it was a brand new feature called um, chat themes. And it was two-way chat themes. You could change the background on your phone. And you know, it would change on other people's phones as well. It was a very simple you know, idea, but people lapped it up. We also introduced custom nudges inside the application. If you double tap, you can poke someone in the app. And for Valentine's Day on Feb 14, we had launched uh, a custom Valentine's Day theme where if you double tap the screen, you see this heart pop up. And it was very carefully crafted, very well sort of done. And you know, this is what we spent our time doing in that sort of winter. And by just making these improvements in the application, we got into about 50 million users, uh, which is 3x in about 12 months from March the year before. And our sticker traffic grew tremendously. We had grown about 10, 15 X in about six months. So we were pretty excited. So at the back of this growth, we ended up raising about 40 million more dollars from sort of Bharati and SoftBank. We were now one of the leading sort of players in the, app in, in the market. But we hit another problem. We started to see churn again in the system. And we thought all our troubles were over. But as soon as that we thought that, um, there was a lot of churn in the system. And the problem was that post 15 million, Post 15 million, India is a very different place. A lot of people don't realize this. And the simple truth was that, you know, Hike worked extremely well on Wi Fi, 3G plus high end devices. But we were absolutely horrible on 2G and low. And the problem was, you know, we were using, you know, when people would join our company, we would give them these really cool high end smartphones to attract them. And we had like a 30, 40 meg Wi Fi pipe at the office. And building inside that office is what caused a big problem. We didn't have that realization that people actually in the market were actually using low-end phones and 2G phones. And the big question was, why didn't we have this realization sooner? And a lot of people will not give you this answer. But looking back, this is exactly why we failed to realize the fact that the market was where it was. It was due to our organizational structure. We had gone from about 15 people to about 40 people. And the problem was, when you're 15 people, a simple top-down approach works. You're 15, 20 people, and it's OK. But as you become 40, 50 people, the company cannot be top-down. Because things are moving so fast, it becomes very hard for you to keep your pulse on the ground if you're top-down. So what we did was we completely reorganized our teams. And we reorganized them as what we call today's squads, which is 
autonomous teams in the sort of company owning different pieces of the puzzle. And this is what a simple squad looks like. You have a product owner who runs the squad and this squad is the simplest unit of development in the company. The squad has designers, developers, QA, a cross-functional team to ensure that each squad can, uh, can sort of operate and develop independently of anybody else in the company. And at that time, we actually had four squads in the company. We had broken down the company to four squads. And we now knew that we had six months. Within six months, the market would sort of pass us by or we'd catch the trend and sort of move with it. So we sort of went into what we call war mode. And between April to September, in the six months, we did a few things. One was we purchased 20 low-end phones. Um, this is a Samsung Duos. This is one of the worst phones in the market. I have four gray hairs on my head. It's because of this phone, by the way. I have it right here. Um, and one team was focusing on reliability on GPRs and 2G networks. That was their goal, which was, can we figure out how we can make Hike work flawlessly on you know, GPRs networks? And on, on 2G, bytes matter. You know. People don't realize this. On 2G, bytes matter, and we'd done a lot of optimizations. We had sort of built some parallel channels, got the, you know, the clogging in the system down to zero. We had done 50 other network fixes, and today, the proud um, you know, point that we discuss with people is that we're actually the fastest messaging app on 2G across all benchmarks. It's because we've been sitting in this market, spending time traveling around the country, figuring out where the sort of you know, problems are and actually fixing them. We had a second team working on optimizing for cheap smartphones. Uh, memory on these devices is extremely low. So we knocked off, the app is very fat. So we knocked off the footprint of stickers, images. We reduced the app opening time by 75%. And today, Hike works extremely well on, of course, low-end smartphones. We had a third team working on the user experience. And the problem was, even though we had done this change, uh, post 15 million, India was very different. So we had to go for a third iteration. And so we destroyed this UI again. And we came and built a very simple one-tab UI. A dedicated focus on chats and nothing else. And we scaled that design to Windows, iOS, and so on and so forth. And a fourth team building new features. And we had ended up shipping a lot of updates in that sort of three or four month period. In, in three months after April to June, we had shipped about 10 updates. And again, making these small improvements in the app was possible because we had these autonomous teams dedicated to solving their own problems. Uh, and we'd gotten to about 20 million users in June. And this was sort of our growth over the last 18 months. Um, so pretty good growth. Um, we were making some changes and you know, sort of the market was responding. And we were pretty confident that now we had enough ammo to go actually take Hike um, you know, to a much, much bigger user base and do a, a marketing campaign. And we were very against doing a marketing campaign because no social media company globally has grown itself by doing a TV campaign, but India was very different. Back last year, there were still very few people online and the only medium to reach the mass market actually was TV. So we took a tra crack at the TV campaign. We launched uh, our first TV campaign on 18th of June, 14. Uh, it was Hike Up Your Life, a very simple youth targeted campaign. Um, and what we saw was tremendous growth. Um, on 19th July, about a month after we launched the TV campaign, on 19th July weekend, 2014, we added a million users a month. It was incredible. And we saw our messaging volume go through the roof. About 10x in about six, seven months. And we were doing about 8 billion messages per day. Um, our sticker volume saw similar growth, if not more. Uh, we grew about 15x in that same time. And back then, we were doing about 2 billion stickers per month. And we had a, some incredible localized stickers in the application. If you used Hike, you're going to love these. And um, you know, I usually present this slide to like, you know, people who, are, who don't understand Hindi. So that's why the English translation is there. And I can't, I'm not going to translate that. So. <laughs> it's a very popular sticker. So the TVC ended on 15th of August. <laughs> and this was our growth before the TVC. And this is where we were after the campaign. We had dwarfed what we had done in those 18 months in just two months. 
And um, this is when we raised our $65 million round by Tiger Global in September 14. And we realized something, which was that shit. Now, India is a very unique country. Um, there are 20 countries with a local, India is a country of 20 countries and a lot of local needs. And there are a few problems that we discovered in the market that are very local to India that I want to talk about that will give you more context on what we're exactly doing and how we're sort of tackling it. One is the go-to-market. Um, I have a quick question for you guys. How many people here in the room have 4G, just by a show of hands? And how many people have 3G or 2G? And is everybody on postpaid? Anybody on prepaid? What, what plans do you have on prepaid? Do you buy like a monthly pack or like? Monthly pack, okay. Okay. Um, so um, the transition to mobile in, in US, China, and Japan was very easy. There was a large population using desk, internet on the desktop for years. So when people went from desktop to mobile, they understood what the internet was, they really got it. But in a market like India, uh, we have one billion people coming online for the first time in their lives, it's a very tricky situation. The problem is that 95% of the market is prepaid. So most people in this room don't reflect what India actually is like. And the problem with prepaid is that people buy mobile consumption in sashes. So I'll buy 10 rupees of talk time, 10 minutes, 10 SMSs. The average balance on a telco wallet is about 15 rupees. So people buy consumption in sachets, and one minute, one SMS is same across all telcos. It's very measurable, it's very tangible. The problem is MBs and GBs are not tangible. One MB on hike is not equal to one MB on YouTube. And as a result of which today we have 30 to 40% data churn month on month in this country. There is a fundamental lack of understanding of data in this market. You'll be surprised how majority of the market sits in this bucket and have some data to show you. Um, the cost of data, um, data is also very expensive uh, in India. And we pulled out the stat, which was how many hours does it take for you to work to afford one GB of data? And it turns out in China, that number is about 3.38 hours. In India, that number is 12.2 hours. If you notice, the absolute amount of, the absolute cost is half of China, but the relative, um, you, know, you know, cost to Indian population is 4x. So data is still very expensive for most people in this country. So there's a lack of understanding of data, and more importantly, data is expensive. And um, to give you another stat, there are 1.1 billion, 1.2 billion people in this country. We have 1.1 billion SIM cards active in this country that are owned by 500 million unique people. We have this dual SIM behavior in India, which is very sort of you know, prevalent. So half a billion people, only 1.1 billion SIM cards each. Out of half a billion people, you have no more than 200 to 250 million smartphone users, out of which you have 150 to maximum 200 million internet consumers. That's the funnel, right? Inside 200 million people, most people consume the internet in a sachet format. Only 30% of the audience has a uh, data pack like you guys, full month or postpaid. 70% uh, of the market has a sachet pack. And I'm on, on one of those packs for the last year, and it is a nightmare to use the internet. Seven days, 150 MB. It is impossible to figure out how your MB finishes. It's impossible to know when your days finish. And when your data pack gets over, you get penalized by the telcos. And you have this thing called bill shock. Right, where you know they dip into your balance and they take all your balance away, and it scares the shit out of people to use the internet. And it was it's a big deal. We were shocked by this. So the second thing we did was we got everybody in the company on prepaid SIM cards. And once you use the internet on a low-end phone with prepaid SIM cards, you really you really feel for the market. And the third thing was cheap smartphones. 80% um, of all smartphones were shipped that are shipped right now are less than $150. Low memory, cheap smartphones, they can run no more than three to six apps on these phones. It's crazy, right? You know, I, have, I upgraded to a Motorola e-phone, it's $120. I have three apps on this phone and my phone's out of storage. That's it, three apps. Because 
Google ends up preloading all this crap on people's phones that you can't really use and you can't pull them out. And it's funny, we, we had one user in Hike who sent 500 messages in three days. And we thought this guy was spamming, so we went a little deeper and this guy was a real user. He had six, seven friends he was chatting to on Hike and had a couple of group chats. And on day four, he turned off. And we said, what? What just happened? So we talked deeper. And this was our reaction, by the way. Um, oops, sorry. Went too fast. We're like, kya ho gaya? what happened? What, do we, what did we do? Did we pushed this guy to churn off? That was our reaction. And why did this guy churn off? The simple answer was that this guy loves Hike and he had no space on his phone. And we said, shit, we have a problem. And a lot of the things we were building, stickers and everything else, consumed a bit more memory on the phone, it's a problem. And so, you, so it became obvious to us. It became very obvious to us that users wanted three to four apps, less number of apps that do more number of things that consume less memory. That was very obvious to us. And messaging is at the top of that list. 80% of time spent on a phone is actually inside a messaging or social application. And it's kind of obvious because as human beings, we're social creatures. In our pocket, we have our family and friends with us 24 seven, we crave social interaction, which is why messaging is by far the highest time spent app on the phone. And along the way, we discovered one more problem. And this was a very big problem. The problem of content discovery. And today, content discovery is completely broken on mobile. If you look at the early days of the internet, uh, the web Yahoo, this was the only way to discover content. You had to go to yahoo.com, you'd have a directory of all these sites, and this is what we call a phone book. And Yahoo initially started off by being thousands, if tens of thousands of websites, but as the internet became bigger and bigger, it became millions, if not billions of web pages. And when you have that, you go from a small phone book to a fat phone book. And it's impossible to scan through a billion pages to get what you want. Google came, solved that problem through search, indexed the entire web, and for the first time, Content discovery became very simple. I could type in something as simple as horoscopes, go to search results via page rank, they'll give you the most popular sites. And more importantly, I could simply click on each link and just flip open one more tab. It was beautifully simple, right? This is how all of us interact with the internet today. Google search made the internet very simple to use and the tab concept made it doubly simpler. And in many ways, one more app became one more tab. That was it. That was the metaphor. And if you look at mobile today, search is completely broken on mobile. The web hasn't scaled to mobile. Most websites are still optimized for these big sort of desktop sites. And more importantly, because this is broken, the market has been pushed to the app market. Apps are the only way we interact with the internet on mobile devices. Now if you go search for horoscopes on the app store, this is what you get. And this is the first half of the first page. Everything is four star plus. Everything has at least a million downloads plus. The question is, which one do you download? Now, you know, th this is a big, big fat phone book. We have the same problem that we had back in sort of the early days of the internet. This is a problem globally, but it's 10x worse in India. Why? And this is a real screenshot from my phone, by the way, right? Um, this is Hike, and I was trying to install Zomato just last week. And this is what I got. I have no space on my phone, literally, right? It is impossible to install more than two, three apps on your phone. So if you have hundreds of apps you want to choose from, and you want to try three or four out, you can't, because you have no space in your phone. And let's say you have space on your phone. Um, you know, just to finish that thought, in India, the number of apps uninstalled is 2x the global average. People try and throw away very fast because they have no space on their phones. And even if you had space in your phones, there are severe problems around data. Uh, data is intangible, and more importantly, data is expensive. So to even download 6 MB of an app, that's potentially speaking 20% of your data plan. So the upfront cost to downloading an app is very, very low. So discovery is tedious, it's expensive, and the internet is very, very difficult to consume, especially in a mobile-first market like India. And 
this whole idea of one more app for one more thing baffles me. It baffles us that like, we don't get it. It is the stupidest and worst way to interact with the internet. And this really reminds us of the CD era. You know, not a single laptop in our office has a CD number. And I'm sure that's the same with everybody in this room as well. CDs are like obsolete. No one uses CDs. And um, the CD was tedious. You had to go to a, you know, offline store and pick something off a shelf. You didn't know what would sort of be in that software. You had to spend a lot of money up front without knowing what the software would sort of entail. Buy it, install it, it would take space in your computer. It was a very tedious process and you couldn't try something very easily. And the CDs got completely obsolete when the browser and the web came. You never had a Facebook, Netflix, Amazon CD. You could just type in facebook.com, netflix.com, open up 10 tabs and boom, that was it. Each tab replaced every single potential CD that could have been built. Apps became CDs to tabs. That was the transition that had happened on, on the desktop. And our belief is that apps are exactly like CDs. They're exactly like CDs. They are tedious to download. They're expensive to download. They take up space in your phone. More importantly, every app you download requires you to log in every time. It makes no sense. I, had, I was in San Francisco just about four to five months back and I'd walked into the Intercontinental Hotel on Howard Street where I was staying. And when I walked in, they said, welcome. Hey, by the way, why don't you download our app? I said, why do I need your app? They said, no, just download it. It'll be, it'll be useful for you. So I opened my phone. I was on data roaming. It was a 25 MB app. I said, okay, fine. I downloaded the application. And I had to sign up to some new service and I did that. And when I went inside, it says, oh, great. By the way, this is where our gym is. This is where the restaurant is. I said, are you kidding me, right? I just spent 25 MB in 20 minutes downloading an application that gave me no information more than a pamphlet that was there in front of the reception. And it, this is the world we live in today. For, for everything, you need one more app that does one more thing. And so in many ways, the smartphones that we have today are actually pretty dumb. You have so many APIs that Google and Apple give you, these powerful APIs, but the only way to make them work and unleash them is to download one more application. So we really believe the app model is broken. Um, this is going to happen, and it's happening globally. The trend started from the east with the WeChats of the world. We believe India is going to be sort of the second sort of wave, and eventually this will go to places like the west because the west are very comfortable. You get an iPhone completely free of cost if you have a two-year contract, and most people in the US and UK are on contracts. Data is assumed to be free. You have three or four GB of data every month with a contract, and an iPhone comes to you completely free of cost. The question is, what's going to solve this? And we really believe it's going to be messaging. It is very clear to us that this is going to be the case. And we believe that messaging is going to do this a million times better than what the browser did back in the desktop era. So we really believe it's time for a new interaction model to emerge. And a simple comparison that I want to draw here is that if an app was one more tab in the browser, what if an app in mobile was simply one more contact in your address book? It's a very powerful thought. And we've been trying this for the last year, and it has been absolutely incredible. One more contact in your address book is one more app. And um, so to give you an idea of what we're trying to build, it's very simple. We're building a new kind of a messaging app that simplifies how people stay connected with one another. And we really believe messaging will change the way people interact with content and services on mobile. And we really believe that messaging will do for mobile what the browser did for the desktop times 100. You have so much more context about people on their phones. And this is exactly what we're building. And um, you know, the question is, what have we been doing in the last 18 months since we raised this round? Um, we scaled up our team. We're a very, fairly large team now, about 250 people. And we took the squad model and we expanded it in a big way. So we are now 12 squads across the company. The problem with the squad model is that each of these squads operates as a completely independent startup team inside the company. So everybody's optimizing for their local maximum, and you forget about the company as a whole. So people got disconnected. People were double building things at the same time, and we said, shit, we have a problem. What do we do? So we introduced these things called chapters. 
And the idea behind chapters was that it was a chapter of excellence across each function. So you would have an Android chapter, you would have like a design chapter, uh, you know, a backend chapter, and we, we stole this idea from Spotify. They do a great job of this stuff in their company. And these chapters would keep each function completely in line, and as a combination of all these chapters, they would be the glue that held each function in the company together. So the Android chapter would meet once a week, and everybody in each squad who's in an Android chapter would meet together and, see, and talk about what they were building, and talk about how they could expose services that were being built in each squad. And we had the sense of camaraderie sort of back in the team. And to give you a simple sense of how this works, the product owner in the vertical squad decides what you build, and the chapter lead helps you figure out how to build it. So you sort of have like a mini entrepreneur and a mini professor in the system. And this allowed us to, this organizational change allowed us to significantly improve the application. We launched a whole new version of Hike um, last year, Hike 4.0. We developed some incredibly amazing features. We had this thing called uh, sticker recommendations. If you're inside Hike on Android, we're bringing this to iOS next month. As you type, if you choose to, it will, it will give you recommendations based on what you've typed for stickers. Very powerful stuff. And the problem was when you have 7,000 stickers inside a phone, it becomes very hard to discover what sticker is right for which moment. And so we made sticker discovery very easy. We had a lot of great, we have a lot of great stickers in the application. These are just some of them that we have in the app. And we also launched a lot more stuff. We launched a ton of stuff last year. Uh, localized stickers, hike offline, which was a variant of hike to SMS where you know, a lot of folks turn their data packs off. And when that happens, there is no way to stay in touch with these guys. So we launched Hike Offline for that. Hike Direct is incredible. It lets you chat and share files completely without the internet by pairing two phones together. And we have people transferring over five terabytes of data on Hike Direct every day. Uh, free group calling, a timeline with loves, hidden mode that lets you hide certain chats in the application, languages and keyboards. But more importantly, we launched news, we launched cricket scores. High daily in coupons. And the way we launched this was simply one more contact in your address book. There was no need to download one more application. All you had to go and do was type in news in your address book inside Hike, and hit opt-in, and boom, you'd get news delivered to you every day. So we went and did a big TV campaign after this again, because we were pretty confident that um, you know, the app was doing really well. And in Jan this year, we announced that we were the first Indian internet company to cross 100 million users. This is a very big feat for us. And if you look at our overall metrics today, we have 100 million users sending 40 billion messages per month, and people are spending 120 minutes per week inside the application. And today we're the largest internet company in India by active users, a stat that not many people know. And in the last three years, if you just look back, uh, a lot has happened. Um, we launched 100 plus features. We launched 140 app updates. That's a lot, it's too much. We have 100 million users sending 40 billion messages per month, and we've just done this in about three years and three months. And Hike is the number one Indian app by far, but the big thing that we've been thinking about for the last six months, and we had some red respect, and there were two big things. Um, one was this squad you know, model that we had built the first version of being only squads was a complete disaster. Squads themselves become siloed teams, and it's like you have 12 different companies inside a company. So we, you know, sort of strapped on chapters, and it made things a lot better, and got sort of at least the functions aligned to work, to make the machinery work much, much better. But, you know, we, we, look, at, we look at the company, and, and I look at the company and running the company in this simple, simple framework which is, you know, our mission is we really believe through messaging we can bring India online. That's our fundamental idea and belief. And the only way you do this is if you solve problems at scale. If you're trying to build, bring half a billion to a billion people online, you gotta solve a lot of problems at scale. And the only way you solve a lot of problems at scale is by giving autonomy to your team as much as possible. If all of us are solving all problems, we're gonna do a pretty shitty job solving all problems. 
However, the only way you can become autonomous is if you actually have some alignment. And alignment not only on which direction you're pointing in, but alignment in how you build stuff as well. And um, you know, one of my team members came up and said, hey, listen, I'm gonna build a torch inside Hike. I said, what? He said, I'm building a torch. It's only one line of code. I said, why? He said, hey, man, it may, it may help us reduce churn. I said, are you kidding me? And it's a great example of what happens if you don't have alignment in the company. Squatches go off in their own tangents and build stuff that may not be relevant to the overall set of mission. So you have to make teams independent. You have to make sure that there's alignment on your North Star, and more importantly, how you build stuff. And that's the only way you can build insanely great things. And we personally believe that if you build insanely great things, that's gonna have a very large impact on the probability success. It's gonna increase the probability of success that you have. And that will allow you in turn to solve more problems at scale. It's pretty straightforward, right? And so what did we do in all these pieces that has gotten us so, you know, where we are? And if you wanna solve problems at scale and bring India online, autonomy, alignment, and percentage of success are by far the most important. So how do we drive autonomy? We had our squads, independent sort of scrum teams or you know, what we call you know, um, startup teams inside the company that were dedicated towards solving a problem. Today we have 12 squads across the, across the company. We have a squad dedicated towards the home screen experience. We have a squad dedicated towards um, the chat experience, a squad dedicated towards stickers and so on and so forth. Um, we drove alignment with chapters. Now this drove alignment extremely well within a function. So the Android guys were aligned, the iOS guys were aligned, the backend guys, the design guys were all aligned. But the problem was the company still, overall, was not necessarily aligned. And we said, what can we do to ensure that people are aligned and are pointing towards the same North Star regardless of the function? And more importantly, are aligned to how we build things and what we value regardless of the function. So we spent, about a year ago, we spent three months talking to everybody in the company. We had about 150, 200 people in the company. And we spoke to them and said, guys, why are you here? Why are you working for Hike? And more importantly, what do you guys stand for? Forget work, forget everything else. What makes you wake up in the morning every day? And we spent three months talking to people and we got sort of what their Core, their own personal core values and principles were. And we took that and we created what we call today the high code. High code is our core values, our operating principles. And these are our operating principles of what we are today. At the same time, a lot of it is what we aspire to be over time and what we believe will make us successful in the long term. And we have 11 codes. It's pretty straightforward. It's not sort of rocket science. One is we really believe if you're at Hike, you have to be completely obsessed and maniacal about our mission. If you don't believe in our mission, you're in the wrong place. As simple as that. Second is you have to build insanely great things. At Hike, we don't do mediocre. It's just not in our DNA. Third is, and you'll be surprised how many people miss this. Solve for the user first. A lot of people come in building for personal satisfaction, and it becomes a problem. They want to build cool and sexy things, and that becomes a big problem when you're sort of building a company at our scale. So always solve for the user first. Four is, as a company, can we drive autonomy and give more ownership to teams in the company? Five is obsess over our metrics, something we're learning to do in the last six months to a year. Have a high bottom people. Um, have individual mastery, which, which in simple terms is, how do you be more self-aware about your actions and thoughts? As simple as that. Have a fierce sense of urgency, always be questioning the status quo and simplifying things. Always put the company over team over self. And you know, all of us have one life to live, so enjoy the journey, make memories, and have fun. These are this is sort of our code at Hike. So alignment comes from chapters and more importantly, our Hike code team. And it has already made such a big difference in the company. But the big question was: let's say you have squads that are aligned, building great things. How do you know those great things are great things? And how do you know they'll be successful? And we have a lot of people, even today, walking in the company and saying, hey man, look at this man, it looks so good, this is gonna work, I'm sure of it. 
This is what my gut feel says. And most often than not, these guys are completely wrong. Completely and utterly wrong. And we've seen this happen millions of times and over and over again. And we said, you know what, it's, it's about time we learned from this in the last year. And the big question was, how do you go and change this mentality and behavior? And it's very simple. Data, metrics, right? Data never lies. And to give you an example of you know, what we've done in the last year itself, we shipped 15 big things last year. Two out of 15 were hugely successful. Like big impact, big drivers. And you know, um, I asked my team, I said, guys, do you think this is a good score or not? And some people said, yeah, this is a great score, yeah. It's fantastic. And some people said, no, it's a pretty bad score. And what emerged out of that discussion was that in every product company, you have this graph. And building products and launching products and shipping products fo follows a power law curve. 2% of the things you ship are monstrous hits, absolutely monstrous hits. About 18 to 20% of stuff is good. It'll give you that sort of you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2% week-on-week growth. And 80% is absolute trash. And the problem we had was we were shipping everything to our users, including the trash. And we said, this has to stop. And the big question that we asked ourselves was, how do we ensure that we ship only the good stuff? The only way we knew, and it's funny, I, sometimes you know, I laugh because we're at such a big scale now. The only way we knew on what would work was to actually launch it in the market and say, chalega in chalega. Let's pray to God it'll work, right? I swear to God. And luckily for us, there are a few people in this company who actually have good intuitions. So we are, you know, you know, right enough to get our company successful to where we are. But how do we get? But but intuition doesn't scale. That's my point. Intuition does not scale. So how do we get in a position where every single team can be as autonomous as possible and has a simple framework to ensure that they know? what works and what does not work as early as process, as early in the process. And it was simple, which is how do you minimize risk as early as possible? And something that we're, sort of, we're working with the narrationist team on right now, which is how do you simply do product discovery? And there is a graph that I really like that I show my team that's now pinned up on all our scrum rows across the company, which is this. And I'm sure many people have seen this this, this you know, image, and for those of you who have not, a lot of us start off by saying, hey, I want to go build a car. I think a car is important. I think people want a car. And you say, OK, and you build a car. It takes you six months, a year, maybe two years, and you build a car, and you ship it, and people say, hey, I don't want a car. And we end up spending six months to a year building all this fancy stuff that people didn't want, and you've literally wasted six months to a year. You know, we raised enough money for us to know that money is not the most valuable thing. It's time. Time is a one-way street. It never comes back. Six months wasted on building something that does not work is a very, very high penalty to pay. And when you ask people why, how did you land on this conclusion? They said, we, we believe people want a car. And they put their feet in the ground, and they pour cement over it, and they have these very hard sort of statements. And we said, OK, fine, why do people want a car? And they say, oh, I don't know. We don't know. We believe. We, our gut feel says people want a car. And then we ask and we say, OK, fine, what problem is a car solving? And they say people want to go faster from point A to point B. right? That's what a car does. It gets you faster from point A to point B. And then we ask the question, OK, fine, do people really even want to go faster from point A to point B? And they say, shit, we don't know. And this has happened so many times in the last three months, it's actually pretty surprising. And it's common sense, but it's surprising how many people, how few people have common sense today in, in the industry. <laughs> um, so you know, the first question was, can you ask the question, hey, listen, do people really want to go faster from point A to point B? And how do you validate that problem in the cheapest way possible? And this is how you do it, right? 
The cheapest way to figure out whether people want to go fast from point A to point B is build a skateboard. I can build a skateboard in two weeks of my free time at home. It's the cheapest thing to do. And by that, you validate the problem. And when you validate the problem, you can build a much better solution. And you actually end up building a much better car. And it's, it's very straightforward. You know, it's not rocket science, but it's, like I said, it's surprising how many people, including myself, sometimes lack common sense. It's a very simple idea, which is, you have an idea, great. How can you validate as soon as possible with some user research and prototyping that the problem you're solving with the idea actually exists? Is the need large enough? Is there a need? And if you prove that, can you build something and ship it out to maybe a percent of people and validate your hypothesis? I believe if I build a skateboard, people in this room, 20% of people will, will use a skateboard and go faster. Right? It's as simple as that. It's not, it's not sort of rocket science. And so we have this saying in the company now, which is, if we build it, it doesn't mean we're going to ship it. So be careful about what you build. The problem we had one year back was that, yeah, I built this, now we must ship it. You know, human beings have this uh, tendency of invested time and effort. If you put so much time and effort, you just, you want to ship it. And um, this simple statements had a big impact on our thinking. And you know, Naresh mentioned this to me when he visited us last month, which was um, code is a liability. And when I say that for the first time, people will be like, what? Are you saying my job is shit to engineers? And we say, no, 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 no. Code is a liability. And you spend 10 minutes pausing, and they said, shit, it makes a lot of sense. Each line of code has to be tested, maintained, this, that, so on and so forth. You end up racking up so much debt in the system, so the less code you have, the better. And so before you even touch one line of code, make sure what you're building has a very high probability of success. It. And the goal with this was to de-risk everything. Don't waste time building crap, right? And when we went to our squads and we talked about the, talked about what we were doing and how the shift to agile is going to happen, we asked, "Hey guys, how many people think this is more process? We're becoming a big company." Almost every single hand went up. Badi company hogi hai, a lot of process. This has become a big company. It's a lot of process now, right? And we said, okay, fine, let us spend the next hour explaining to you what we're trying to do. And when people realize that we are trying to make each and every person more productive, and we're trying to improve the probability of success of each team and every single person in the company, a light bulb turns on in their head. Nobody wants to be the person who at the end of the year can't brag about what he shipped to his friends and family. No one wants to be that guy. You want to talk about how the feature you shipped had 10 million active people using it every month. And when we, when we, when we sort of explain the team this idea, they got it. They said, shit, let's go and actually do this. And this is what Agile is about. This is what Scrum is about, which is, you know, all this stuff gets enabled through Agile and Scrum. You have autonomous teams through squads. You have a lot of alignment through the chapters and also the code that we have. And we have a simple sort of framework or thinking or what we call a new approach to problem solving that encompasses all this stuff and makes it repeatable, makes it predictable, and more importantly, everything just becomes objective. That's it. All conversations become absolutely objective. And what's more important is our discussions become easier. The vocabulary in the company changes. Now we talk about, hey, listen, what's happening in the next two weeks? We have two weeks for this, right? And while we had this in some form of fashion below, before, it was never this structured. And we used to have these two-month releases, three-month releases, building a car all the time. And we said, no, let's go to sort of these, these thin slice model, this thin, thin slice model. And our discussions are simply, hey, listen, what's on your sprint board for two weeks? What are you shipping? What's the measure of success? And the best part is that the feedback loop is so fast that every single product owner who runs a squad, and more importantly, every single engineering leader who runs a squad and partners with the product owner, the feedback loop from the market is very fast. Every two weeks or four weeks, they get feedback on what's working and what's not working. 
And that is the best way to make teams autonomous and scale this culture. And the impact so far in the last two or three months since we've started this journey has been tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. And if, there's, if, if I were to sum up um, all the stuff that we're doing in just one slide, it would be this. Agile really helps you remove the bullshit and keep people's ego in check. That's it. When people walk into the room, if they don't have data backing up what they're talking about, it becomes a very, very embarrassing situation for them. And what happens is culture gets formed whether you choose to or not. And it is this kind of thinking, this kind of framework that forces a culture that's very objective, that keeps people's egos in check, and more importantly, just knocks all the bullshit out of the system. And with that, I want to thank you guys. <laughs> and the quarter itself. Tencent made about $1.7 billion of net profit in one quarter itself from uh, a business model or multiple business models built on top of messaging. Um, to answer your question in a simple way, there are three big parts on how we'll make money over time. It's not a focus right now. One is we really believe that given that the app model is so broken, especially in a market like India, given the constraints that you actually have, and how cheap messaging actually is, messaging will play a very large role in commerce, something people um, cannot picture, but something we believe will happen. Messaging will play a humongous role in middle tail commerce and long tail commerce in this market, given how simple and cheap actually messaging is as a medium to communicate. Second is virtual economy. But that's going to take some more time because for a virtual economy to sort of kickstart, you need a critical mass of people onto the internet, using the internet in a very, very uh, deep fashion. Uh, that's not happened yet in India. Uh, only 30% of 200 million people are actually using the internet in a very sort of second nature deep sort of fashion. Our guess is that when that number reaches 100 million people, that's when seeds of a virtual economy will come through the roof. That's number two. Number three is we really believe there's an interesting opportunity for brands to talk to users on the application. Now, when I say that, people say, oh, spam, oh my god. And we don't want to do that. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out very tastefully how can you actually go and do this. And there are good examples and bad examples of this globally. The worst example is uh, Line. If you use Line, they spam you 24-7. And messaging is supposed to be personal. It's supposed to be intimate. You can't do that in a messaging application. But that's going to be number three. And make it, a business model always has a two-sided uh, view. Consumers will pay, or brands and partners will pay. And you've got to tap into sort of both sides of the, the, the economy. That's broadly speaking how we expect to make money over time. No, I think if you look at the best, first of all, why would we want to return the money? <laughs> we raised it with such, we raised it with such difficulty, we're not giving the money back. <laughs> no, our goal is, see, at the end of the day, the, 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 the responsibility to the shareholders is secondary, not primary. Our primary responsibility is can we build some insane stuff in the market? If we do that, our shareholders will get a phenomenal return over time. And if you look at some of the, the biggest social companies globally, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, Tumblr, they've all raised north of half a billion dollars before they've gotten to a point where they actually kickstart a business model. In a social service, you need to be able to figure out what the social product means to a consumer, what it means to you in your daily life. Um, we have a lot of people who use Hike in a very deep fashion. As a matter of fact, internally we are tracking this thing called hourly active users, which is a messaging app, you need to track that, which is, is, is someone present between 9 and 10 in the morning on Hike. And as Hike becomes a platform, they're doing news, scores, coupons, and so on and so forth. So we see people using the app for much more than messaging as well. And what we've got to figure out is what Hike means to people before we actually go deploy a business model uh, in the application. Our, we don't want to become like a Nimbus or anybody. We don't, right? We're very clear about that. And that requires time and patience. Um, we're only three and a half years old. Companies like Facebook are 15 years old. So there's a lot of time for us to go figure out what to do. Yep. Sure. 
No, I don't. Yeah, you know, very early on, and our end goal has not changed. We really believe through messaging would bring India online. We didn't know what that looked like three years ago. So very early you know, on in our journey, we competed completely head on with WhatsApp. And we looked at our data again and again, and we realized something very interesting. There is a large overlap between our user base and WhatsApp. And people are using Hike for very different things in addition to messaging than simple messaging and photos. And most of the user base, by the way, is between 15 and 25. That's where we're very, very strong. But our, our pitch to the market is very simple. If you want simple text and photos, go to WhatsApp. You're better off there. But if you want a world online where the internet's a lot simpler and you can you know, play games with your friends, you know, browse news with your friends, and so on and so forth, if you want something that's going to make your life simpler through messaging, you come to Hike. And we're not very surprised that people actually use both applications. And there are different combinations of people. So we have a lot of people who have 700 friends on Hike who use it heavily, but they'll have their mom, dad on WhatsApp. And their biggest groups on WhatsApp, those you know, mass market alumni groups that you have, right? So we, we want to build Hike as a very intimate personal application. But you know, if you talk to me in nine months from now, it's going to be very hard to compare Hike to WhatsApp. That's the goal. We, we believe that in each market, if you look globally, there are two very big dominant messaging players. QQ and we, uh, WeChat in China, uh, Part Talk and Kakao Talk in Korea. You have four guys in the US. You have iMessage, you have Snapchat, you have Messenger, you have Kik. Uh, you have, I think, WhatsApp and Snapchat in Europe. And in India, now it's becoming Hike and WhatsApp. So we really believe two messaging apps will win that do fundamentally very different things. That's the goal. will become sub-2000 pretty soon, yeah. right? And data is going to be, I don't know, perhaps in, a, in another 18 months, the price points will come down even 10 times once, once Reliance Geo comes, sure. comes on full screen. So wouldn't your business model be seriously challenged at that time? That's, That's a great question. question. And you know, everybody asking that question, which is, hey, are you building for like a temporary sort of, you know, um, dip you know, in the market? Now, our response is very simple. Um, even if phones get better, faster, cheaper, and we hope they become better, faster, cheaper, we really hope data becomes cheaper as well, um, the app model is still broken. The app model is still fundamentally broken. And it's important that I describe this. Technology swings in a pendulum back and forth. And whenever a new paradigm emerges, you always have a fat client model that starts off first. Look at the desktop world, the CD model was a fat client model. And all processing happened on the desktop. Because the network itself was very expensive and not cheap enough to actually have you do stuff in the cloud. As the network became cheaper, even though processing power increased tremendously on phones, everything went to the cloud. Because the thin client model always emerges to be the lightweight, faster, cheaper, and simpler interaction model for a paradigm. On mobile, pendulum swung back. We are on a fat client model. The app model is a fat client model. Network has been so far very expensive, but when network becomes cheaper, the thin client model will emerge. The question is, what is the operating system for the thin client model on mobile? It was the browser and the desktop. We believe it's going to be messaging on mobile. That's the way we think about this. So how would I get the data for, for the market to prove my idea? You know, it's, um, it's very simple these days. Um, it's very simple to grab a hold of 10 people who are walking down the street and talk to them. Number two is, it, it, it is very cheap in this day and age to build prototypes. If you look at Marvel, Envision, all these services, you can, you can actually build a very high fidelity prototype in two hours. So you can take this prototype and grab 10 people down the street and say, hey, can you use this? And that's what we've started doing now in the company. Fortunately for us, we have a large user base so we can pull people in. But that's the best way. And the question is, what's the cheapest way you can figure out what to show to consumers? And that'll help you validate not only the problem you're solving, but also the cheapest first version or to build as well. And we've gotten into that mode across the company now, and it's paying like huge dividends.
you know, Ashley, it's Android. It's, it's not, um, all, all the messaging apps are competing to make the, the native operating systems completely obsolete. And if you guys heard about Google's announcement at Mobile World Congress, they announced the RCS initiative, which was a messaging initiative, because they finally realized that, holy shit, messaging is going to be the new OS for mobile. So over time, you know, my worry is that Google kicks us off the platform. That's what I'm worried about. Um, we are a very, very strong number two player in the market. In the messaging market, we're a strong number two. It's us, it's, it's WhatsApp, us, and Facebook Messenger is a very distant number three. Uh, not many people use Facebook Messenger as their primary messaging product. It's a bit of a reactive sort of product. So I think that's it. And I think also the competition is just ourselves. Can we execute on this vision or not? It's a very complicated piece to do. I think these are the two pieces that we think about and what keeps me up at night every day. Yeah, you know, we, we don't store anything. It's a very simple policy. We don't store anything at all on our servers. And um, we're also not bound by telecom regulations, so that helps. Um, and that's it. So even if someone hacked our system, there's nothing there. <laughs> so that's how we do it. It's the easiest, cheapest, simplest way to scale up a messaging application. Over time, that may change. If that changes, the first thing we would do is end to an encryption. answer that question just yet. <laughs> Maybe soon. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. <laughs>